My name is Dale Cutler, and I've been in the industry for four decades. I started snowmobiling in 1973, and uh, I've had my business going since 1988. That's when Cutler's Performance Center came into existence. Uh, in 1992, I ratcheted up uh, the clutching segment of our business and started to build some clutch components to fit specifically Arctic Cat. We are now branching out to other manufacturers. Yeah, I started to race in uh, 1985, I think it was, or 84. Um, and I decided at that point that there wasn't enough quality clutching components out there to tune my clutches and to make the snowmobile do with what I really wanted to do. And so at that time I started to uh, modify other factory uh, made components and try to fit those to my need. The more I modified them, the more I found that there was a need for aftermarket clutch components to calibrate the clutch the way that I wanted it to do and I couldn't go out there and buy the components because in the uh, early uh, 70s and mid 70s and even up into mid 1980s there was not a lot of clutching components out on the market. Out here in the west we have high elevation issues to deal with and the clutches just not did not perform the way that we wanted them to perform and so the, to answer your question what we would do is we would take a cam arm uh, often called a weight and we would take and start uh, grinding it to get the right RPMs and modifying the shape and profile in order to have different clutch characteristics. Um, back in those days we would take springs and we'd stick them in a vise and try to uh, pull the coils apart in order to change tensions of springs because we just weren't that sophisticated but all of those things have changed now where uh, we manufacture components and consumers do not have to modify their own they can just buy pre-made components that are modified for their needs. Your question is are all clutches created equally and the answer is no they are not. Uh, clutches are manufactured according to the engineers criteria what they feel would be the most important components and uh, cost effective in order to build a clutch if it wasn't for cost I think that we would see all the manufacturers build different components but but here's a, an example of two different clutches this one's made by Polaris and this one's made by Articat they have similar function and maybe from the outside that they look the same but uh, and how they work is very much the same but the shape and the diameters and the angle on the movable shees and stationary shees they all differ and the components uh, and the materials that they place in for like the spiders and the buttons and the bushings that are in the face plate and in the movable sheath bushings those are all made out of different components um, and different materials so the manufacturers will uh, call out with what they feel is important for durability and function and manufacture that clutch according to with what they feel like that they want to accomplish the main components in a clutch that make a clutch work um, First of all, you need to understand that there's two clutches. You have a drive clutch here, and then you have a driven or considered a secondary clutch right here. The drive clutch is RPM sensing, and the driven clutch is torque sensing. They have different responsibilities to accomplish an overall smooth transition of clutching needs. In a drive clutch, there's two main components. One of the components would be a engagement spring. The purpose and function for an engagement spring is exactly what it's called. It controls the engagement. Uh, longer or stiffer springs will delay engagement and the RPMs will rise before the clutch engages. The second component in a drive clutch is called a cam arm, often called a weight. These centrifugal weights are hinged on a pin and they spring out and as they do so they will contact the roller on the spider and push the movable sheath together. The movable sheaths happen to be the function where 
this movable sheath that's moving up and down that when that collapses then it pushes the drive belt further in the pulley area and causes the machine to change uh, gear ratios. So the, the fly weight or considered cam arm or weight controls the RPM and uh, that is the major component in a drive clutch. The driven clutch controls the amount of torque sensing action to control if, if the snowmobile is under a load, if you're going uphill or downhill, the spring and the helix work together to create efficiency to cause the, the clutches to upshift or downshift. And so upshift means that the drive belt will go further in the groove and backshift is when the belt rides uh, out further in the sheath area. This will not only control vehicle speed, but it also controls the uh, throttle response um, and the uh, acceleration and deacceleration of the driven clutch. The most important thing uh, to focus in on uh, as you're looking at uh, a clutch and its efficiency would be to first of all determine is the clutch in mechanical uh, is, the, is the clutch mechanically sound in other words are the bushings and the weights um, and the springs are they all in good shape and if they're if the clutches are mechanically sound and they're not wore out then the second area that you want to focus in is uh, are the clutches clean so having a clean clutch is really important I recommend that the both clutches should be blown out with compressed air every other ride. That's my personal opinion. That's what I do on my snowmobile. And then about two or three times a year, I will actually remove the clutches and uh, wash them. I'll power wash them and get all the dirt and grime and belt fiber out, uh, disassemble them, make sure that uh, all the components are in good shape and reassemble them and put them back uh, on the snowmobile. The changes that a snowmobiler can make in his drive clutch would have to do with the calibration components. Uh, you can change your springs if you'll remove the face plate bolts. The cover plate is easily removed. A uh, spring can be removed and a different spring of a different rate can be installed and this can be screwed back together. Uh, that is a very simple change for most snowmobilers. doesn't take special tools to do that. The other change that can take place would be uh, some of the manufacturers have what they call adjustable cam arms or the weight that is in the cam arm can be changed or be manipulated. So for example on the brand of cam arms that we make we have set screws. These set screws come in different lengths that you can see here and you have a little wrench and it's simple just to take a set screw and this is a threaded and you can go ahead and thread this in the cam arm and uh, they can be easily removed without belt removal, clutch guard removal, or disassembling of the clutch, which makes them very popular as far as fine-tuning the clutch. So, for example, if a clutch is designed and manufactured to uh, go from 5,000 feet to 7,000 feet, and for your particular day of riding, let's pretend that you're at nine or 10,000 feet, then the clutch will be overweighted and you won't receive the right RPMs. In other words, you won't be on your power band um, because you have too heavy of cam arm weights. So using adjustable cam arms, you would simply remove a set screw um, and install either a lighter set screw or remove them completely. And this would allow the fly weight or the cam arm to be lighter, which would give you more RPMs and if you have the correct RPMs with what the engine and the exhaust pipe are manufactured for then you will receive more performance. So getting your engine to run at the right RPMs is really really important and uh, that is something that many snowmobilers can do themselves. What you can do in your secondary clutch to improve it would be to um, identify the efficiency based upon experience of which angle that you should run on your helix. 
uh, the manufacturers in the aftermarket company have designed different angles. These angles are normally recorded in a numerical number. The higher the numerical number, the uh, greater the angle is that uh, rolls into the, that interfaces with the roller in the drive clutch. And so a steeper angle will cause the drive clutch to upshift faster or to accelerate faster assuming that the spring and the helix interface correctly together. So uh, one of the common uh, adjustments that many people who are seeking more performance will do to their driven clutch is to change the angle on the helix. Um, depending on your driver weight and your snow conditions, your altitude and how much horsepower you have, you will change different helixes. Some of the helixes are a straight angle, like the, for example this helix right here is a 38 degree helix and the manufacturers as delivered from like Articat for example this 2012 through 2014 driven clutch would come with a 36 degree angle. So to get it to accelerate faster some uh, tuners or mechanics will change to a higher degree allowing the snowmobile to accelerate but if you get too large of an angle it will affect your back shift which means that when you back off out of your throttle and allow the clutch to shift down into low gear that it might be a little bit sluggish or let's say that you have a 275 pound or a 300 pound rider they are not going to be able to use as high numerical helix as a snowmobiler who might be a 120 or 160 pound rider because of the uh, power that is being driven through the, the clutches. The other change that you can make in a driven clutch would be to change to a different spring. From time to time I have customers ask me what things should they do on a clutch, what things can be modified and what things should be changed and what things should be left to the experts. And uh, I have seen over the years many customers will spend several hundred dollars in buying helixes and playing Russian roulette with just trying to at random try different uh, degree helixes trying to get more performance out of a clutch. and. Uh, they think that there's just some magic helix out there that is going to solve all their clutching problems and that is not the case. Uh, a good knowledge of how clutches work and what the angles do should be uh, thought about before making purchases. It might be a good idea to talk with other friends or even to look on forums to decide uh, what other customers are using before you spend a lot of your hard-earned money in just randomly buying products. The same thing is true with springs. The springs come in different wire diameters which will change different tensions, spring tensions or what we call spring rates and just to arbitrarily go out and get a handful of springs and keep trying them would not really be the best way. When you when you make a change in a clutch, you should make one change at a time. Never make more than one change as you're testing. That way you can determine with what your results are. While you're out riding your snowmobile, from time to time, snowmobile clutches uh, will start to wear out. They will fatigue. They will just get tired and start acting weird. So some of the first signs of a clutch that is starting to fail will be maybe poor belt life. Another example would be a clutch that sticks. When you back out of the throttle and you get back into the throttle, the clutch clutches will not shift. They will bog and uh, you will lose RPMs. And those are telltale signs of a clutch that is starting to fatigue. Most drive clutches in the industry, at least those that are used in deep powder and high elevation uses that they are typically tired and need some kind of maintenance or repair after about 1200 to 1500 miles has been my experience. If you are a trail rider and you have less load on your engine like flatlanders and trail riders uh, in the Midwest and the East, 
then the mileage would be approximately twice with what I've indicated for mountain use. If I have a customer that calls up and that wants to purchase a clutch kit from our company, the first thing that I will do before I will sell a clutch kit to our customers is that I will ask them what their driver weight is. Rider weight is important because I'm going to clutch different from a 150 pound rider than I will a 275 pound rider. So rider weight is important. I will also ask what elevation that they ride. Um, elevation is a, is a determination on how much available horsepower that we have to drive the components. In other words, at sea level, we're going to have more available horsepower on a naturally aspirated machine than we will at 10,000 feet. Therefore, the approach in building a clutch kit will be significantly different because we will address uh, a loss of horsepower because of altitude. The other thing that I will ask a consumer before a clutch kit is sold would be the style of riding. Uh, each rider will ride differently. Some of my customers just like to climb hills and, and if you are a hill climber and you just bang on hills all day, that's going to be take a completely different need than someone who would be drag racing or a customer who would be just trail riding in the Midwest. So we take riding conditions uh, to be uh, very important. Uh, also, the snow load on the track and the length of track would be an important thing to determine before purchasing a clutch kit. If, if a consumer gets on the telephone and tries to purchase a clutch kit and the person who is taking his order does not ask these basic questions, then you can be re uh, assured, in my opinion, that they're just going to take your money and that you will not be getting your money's worth. You will not get a tailor-made clutch kit to fit your exact needs. If you have a snowmobile that has two or three thousand miles on it and if your clutches are wore out, you should not be purchasing a clutch kit. What you need to do is purchase new uh, clutches. If the clutches are completely wore out, uh, let's replace them before you invest money in a uh, clutch. The second thing that I would encourage customers to do is make sure that the snowmobile is geared correctly. If you have too high of gearing, let's say for mountain use, then uh, your efficiency in your clutch and where your belt rides in your clutch is going to be uh, affected by, by gearing. Too high of gearing will cause additional heat in your clutches and will cause excessive belt wear in a clutch. So having the correct gearing is very important. The other mechanical areas that would affect uh, clutching would be uh, the uh, compression of an engine. If you have a, a snowmobile, for example, that has five or seven thousand miles on it and it's never been rebuilt, this engine is going to be down on power and would not uh, be able to pull or be, you would not be able to utilize the same components in a tired engine that you would in a fresh engine. One, one of the uh, elements that is greatly overlooked at in a clutch happens to do with a dry belt. Dry belts are manufactured by uh, several different companies. Uh, each company has a different viewpoint on how that they should build a, a dry belt. When a dry belt starts to wear out, a couple things happen. Uh, number one, that the cords will start to pull on this outer uh, area right here that is indicated by my small fingernail. The other thing that will happen on a dry belt, if you will take it, uh, another thing that uh, needs to be examined on a dry belt is you should take your dry belt uh, off your machine periodically and flip the belt inside out by doing this and then looking in the cracks of the inside of the belt and see if there is any uh, breakdown in the fiber. You can see that there is fiber cloth that's impregnated on the outside of this belt and in the uh, valley of this dry belt if you see cracking, uh, I call it belt rot, uh, you will actually see the fiber and a, a little crack starting to exist. When belts uh, break, typically they will have this uh, uh, failure uh, happen where a dry belt is wore out just from fatigue and, 
and old mileage. And so that is one of the first things that I do when I look at a dry belt. I also look for burnt spots. Dry belts are made to have about a 20 to 25 thousandths clearance between the side of the dry belt and the stationary and movable sheets. So when you look at your dry belt and you drop your dry belt in a clutch, you want to examine and make sure that the distance between your movable and stationary sheath and the dry belt is not uh, too sloppy. This is a brand new clutch and a brand new dry belt and we have the correct uh, clearances between the belt. Uh, the other thing that will affect clutching will be if the belt stretches out. Sometimes, matter of fact, always a high mileage belt will stretch out and when it stretches out there's what we call belt deflection. Belt deflection means that the belt is too loose as if the belt fits in the drive clutch and the driven clutch if the distance between the two clutches uh, if there's too much movement of the belt then you will need to adjust the driven clutch and take up a belt deflection.